We are on Yom Kippur. So if you open up to uh, Leviticus 23, we're going to pick up in verse 26. We have finished the spring feasts. We started the fall feasts with the Feast of Trumpets. I know some of you don't really care for the shofar blowing. I want you guys to be able to recognize the sound. All right. So we're picking up in verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. Okay, so the tenth day of what month? Tishri. Okay. Um, the seventh month is Tishri. The first day of the month is the Feast of Trumpets. The tenth day is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at the evening, from the evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Okay? Um, we're going to hit this today. We're going to look a little bit deeper. We've spent several weeks going over the actual Day of Atonement, the directives that God gave to Moses and Aaron as to uh, what was supposed to happen. We talked about the sacrifice for the, the high priest and his family. We talked about the choosing of the goats, the scapegoat, uh, the goat for Azazel and the goat for the Lord. Um, we, we talked about the sacrifice and then the process that, that they had to go through to make atonement. A couple things that, that really jump out at us. The first thing is this is not for personal atonement. Okay, this is not for you to wait to this day and then bring all your sins before God and have them atone for you. You are still accountable for personal atonement. Okay, this, this atonement was for the nation. It was for unknown sins. And, and this was to cover the people of Israel. All right. So you were still responsible. As a matter of fact, from the 1st to the 10th, it was called the Days of Repentance. And those were the days, uh, the month of Elul, the, the sixth month, was the month that they spent in preparation for the Feast of Trumpets. And then from the Feast of Trumpets to uh, the Day of Atonement, they spent in repentance and making sure their relationship with God was right, making sacrifice for their sins, getting themselves right with God. Because if they were not right with God on this day, then... This was not going to help them. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, we're looking down a little bit further. We talked about this last week. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. Now, the, the Hebrew term forever, it's not, it's not the same understanding we English, in our English, have for forever. When we say forever, we mean for eternity. It never ends. Okay? That's not what it means in Hebrew. In Hebrew, forever means for a set time. Okay? For the time that has been set, you will do this. Okay? So that's one of those things where they give us the equivalent in English, but the meaning isn't really the same. Because if, you, if this meant for eternity, then why did Jesus go to the cross on our behalf? We would still be stuck making the same sacrifice year after year. And we're actually going to get into that next week as we wrap up the, the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. Okay? Um, just another note real quick. We call these feasts. The Hebrew word is not feast. The Hebrew word is an appointed time. Some of them involved eating. Some of them required fasting. This one required fasting. There was no feasting this day. You were to fast. Okay? Um, so, let's go back in here. We're going to kind of touch on a couple things. Um, first off, there are three names that the Jews use for this day. The first one is Yom Kippur, which means the Day of Atonement. Yom being day, Kippur meaning atonement. 
The second one is Shabbat Shabbaton, which means the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Okay? This is the only time in Scripture that I have found where a particular day is called the Sabbath that is not the day of the week. Okay? This is the only place that I've found. The only time that God actually refers to a specific day as a Sabbath. And, and they call it the Sabbath of Sabbath. This, this is like the ultimate Sabbath of the year. This is the highest. This is the pinnacle. Okay? The, the third one is um, Yom HaKippurim. And that means the Day of Atonements. Plural. Okay? Why is it plural? Well, because to the Jewish thinking, atonement was being made for both the living and the dead. Okay? Um, where they get this is very convoluted, and, and quite honestly, uh, it's not based in Scripture. But that was their thinking. So if you hear any of these terms, you'll know what they're talking about. They're talking about the Day of Atonement. All right, so there's a couple of things that I want to go over with you. Um, we talked last week about atonement. Um, we talked about the understanding of the word. Uh, it is kafar, and it means to cover. Uh, the same passage is used in Noah when God told him to cover the ark with pitch. Inside and out, it was completely covered. That's the same idea. The idea also carries with it um, the idea of bringing two parties together that have been at enmity to make peace between the two parties. Okay, so there's, there's an idea of covering and there's an idea of bringing together with the, the word for atonement. Okay, um, a couple of things that this did not cover. It did not cover sin that you were not repentant of. It did not cover rebellion. So even though this was for the nation and it covered the nation of Israel, it did not cover your individual sin. If you were living in a, in a sin and you had not repented of the sin, you were not forgiven. You were not, your sin was not atoned for. Okay? A um, couple things that we want to look at, and i got to kind of back up a little bit so you guys understand where I'm coming from here. Uh, in Leviticus 16, we talked about the two goats that were brought for... Um, the Day of Atonement, they were brought in, the young male goats, and then the priest, the high priest, would by lot, would choose one of the goats to be the goat for the Lord, and then the other goat to be the goat for Azazel. Now Azazel, we spoke about, um, it can mean a number of things, it can be a, a high barren place, it can be the particular name of a demonic uh, entity that lived in the desert, and, and it can mean just really the bearer, okay? Um, the high priest would cast lots and Jewish tradition tells us that every year the lot for the Lord fell on the goat to the right which was considered good fortune okay this was considered a blessing up until about 30 AD when from then to 70 AD the lot fell to the goat on the left which was considered bad luck okay does anybody understand what happened in 30 AD, circa 30 AD? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The other thing that Jewish tradition tells us and Jewish history tells us is that when the priest would, would choose, the high priest would choose the goat, he would take a red cord and he would wrap it around the horn of the goat that was the scapegoat, the one for Azazel. And when the goat was taken out away from the camp, um, the, the cord, when, when it was done, the cord would turn white. Now, some traditions say they took a part of that cord and actually nailed it to or hooked it to the temple or the tabernacle wall, and that cord would turn white, meaning that the sacrifice was accepted, that, that, that all of their sins had been taken away and, and atoned for. Again, about 30 AD, this ceased to happen. It never turned white again. Why? Because the sacrifice of the goat was insufficient. A greater sacrifice had been made. Okay, there was no need for the, the goat to be continued year after year. And again, we'll get into that next week as we look into the fulfillment of the Feast of Atonements. Okay, so 
the, the two goats come in and they're separated, one for the Lord. This is the one that would be sacrificed and its blood would be sprinkled in before the Ark of the Covenant, in the holy place, and on the brazen altar. Okay, This was to make atonement for the people of Israel. The other goat would be the scapegoat, and this goat is figuratively, and, and perhaps even literally, I don't know, because I don't see things the way that God sees them, all of the sins of the nation of Israel were put on this goat. The, the high priest would lay his hands on the head of the goat, and he would confess the sins of the nation of Israel, and then he would put that goat into the care of a man that was selected, who was to take it out away from the camp. Okay, They were to take it out into the wilderness, to the barren area, a place where the goat could not turn around and come back into the camp, because nobody wants their sins coming back to visit them. Now, we know uh, in the second temple, um, we know that it was a tradition for the man to take the goat out away from the city and to push it off of a cliff, so there was no way the goat was coming back in. Okay, that's, that's part of the meaning of Azazel, high place. Uh, they thought that that was, you know, whoop, over it went and all of our sins with it. Okay, now you have to understand these two thinkings to understand the scriptures that we're going to look at now, because what I want to talk about is the messianic implication to the Day of Atonement. Because like I've said before, each of these feasts is a prophecy to something that God is doing in his plan for the redemption of mankind. All right, and we saw that the first four feasts in the spring were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. And we see that the last three, um, we believe, are going to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. All right, so let's look at some of these passages. Um, if you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah 53. We're not going to read over the whole chapter. I'm just going to pick out a couple of verses so you can understand what's going on. <clears throat> okay, so Isaiah 53, we're going to jump down to verse 4. Actually, I'm going to turn here so I can read with you. We're going to read verses 4 through 6, and then we're going to jump down to verse 8. Okay, these should be very familiar passages for you. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we'll jump down to verse 8, it says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered uh, that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Now, let's go back and look at this prophecy. Uh, first, I need to kind of give you a little bit of a, a, a segue here, because modern rabbinic teachers uh, do not consider these passages to be messianic passages. They say, oh, no, no, this, this, these passages deal with the nation of Israel and all that we suffer under the hands of the Gentiles. Well, the problem with that is, besides the obvious reading speaking about the Messiah, is that this teaching didn't come into play until about 1000 AD. Prior to that, every writing that we have concerning these passages declare it to be a messianic prophecy. This is what the Messiah is going to do when he comes. Okay, <clears throat> Right about 1000 AD, the teaching started to change, and they, they started to shift away from that to, no, this, this is not messianic, this is, this is about the people of Israel. Okay, I believe this is right in line with what Paul writes about in Romans when he talks about, you know, for a time, that they're set aside for a time, that the, the Gentiles might be gathered in. I think this is part of the blindness that they have. Okay, so let's go back here, because there's a couple things I want to draw, draw out. Uh, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. If you guys have been paying attention over the last few weeks, you'll see afflicted comes up a lot. Okay? 
We just read in, in Leviticus 23 that the people had to afflict themselves. We read in Leviticus 16 that as part of the day, the people had to afflict themselves. Um, scripture does not indicate to us clearly what afflict themselves meant. So using some other scriptures, the Jews thought it meant that they had to fast. Okay, And so nothing was eaten from sundown on the 9th, which would technically be the, the beginning of the, the 10th, until the evening of the 10th, they were, they were to fast. Okay, So, um, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Now, remember those two goats we talked about? The first one that was sacrificed for the Lord was so that there would be peace between God and Israel. This is the first lamb right here. This is the first goat. Okay, Jesus is being the sacrifice that was chosen by God to be the sacrifice on behalf of the people, that his blood would cover the people. Okay, But then read the next verse. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now remember what the high priest had to do to the scapegoat? He had to lay his hands on the scapegoat and confess all of the sin of the people, thereby imparting the sin on the scapegoat, who would then carry the sin away. See, Jesus Christ is both sacrifices. When the Messiah came, he came to be the goat, the sacrifice for the Lord. He also came to be the goat that would bear our sins away, the goat for Azazel. Okay? And then looking down in verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. This is the whole idea of the Day of Atonement, that on this day the sins of the nation were covered, the sins of the people were covered. We go, well, I, I thought, Pastor, you said that um, you know, the, the Day of Atonement wasn't for personal sin. Jesus superseded all of it. He, he wrapped it all up in a, in a bow, and he gave it to us and said, here, take it. It's, it's all covered. And again, we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper next week when we get into, God willing, we get into the New Testament fulfillment and how we see these things being played out. Okay? So, uh, another passage we're going to go to. Um, Let's get down here to verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Again, the whole idea in this prophecy that Isaiah is given is the fulfillment, the conclusion, the, 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 the grand finale for the Day of Atonement. Okay, For the atoning of sins. Now, this part, I believe, has been accomplished by what Jesus did at Calvary. Okay? This part of the, the Day of Atonement has been done. The problem is the Day of Atonement was specifically given to the people of Israel that the nation of Israel's sins would be forgiven, right? I mean, that's what we just studied. Where is the nation of Israel right now? They're in rebellion. They're lost. Okay? Now, keep in mind, we like to take everything that's said in Scripture, we like to twist it and blend it and shove it through that good old USA knot hole and pull it out on the other side and say it all applies to us. Indirectly, yes, it does apply to us. Because all of the feasts that were fulfilled in the spring feasts, the Passover, the, the first fruits, the latter fruits, and Shabbat, oh, they do apply to us. But whom were they given to first? Israel. Israel. Now remember the passage that talks about the first will be last and the last will be first. The offering that Jesus did, the fulfillment of the spring feasts, were given to the people of Israel first. And then to us. Okay? 
Now, I'm, I'm going to give, uh, this is kind of a spoiler for next week. But I'm going to give you a little spoiler. I think that's the, the first will be last, and then the last will be first. We'll be the inheritors first. We will receive first the, the fulfillment of the fall feast because I believe that the church will not be here. Because when that trumpet blows, we're out. We're gone. Okay? And then we see this time of tribulation that is going to come on the people of Israel. And, and the first part of it, they're going to be thinking, hey man, everything's great. We got this guy that's finally standing up to the rest of the world and defending us and bringing peace. Yay us. And then things are going to turn and, and it's not going to be yay us. It's going to be boo-hoo. What happened? And then at that point, when all the nations are gathered against them, the people of Israel will call out to the Almighty God. And guess who's going to show up? And he's coming. He ain't coming on a donkey. He's coming on a white horse. He's going to put his foot down on the Mount of Olives. The earth is going to split. And it's going to be a bloodbath. Because he is going to put a right everything that has been made wrong. Okay? So, but we're not here. We're following it. We're not here to see this. We're the last that became first. See, they're going to be, they were the ones that was given to first, but they're the ones that are actually going to inherit and receive it last. Okay? So, let's, let's look here a little bit more. I've got a couple other passages that I want to look at. Uh, Psalm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 49. Flip over there real quick. <clears throat> Go down to verse 5. Okay. Uh, and now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my strength has become my... Uh, my God has become my strength. Now, again, this is a prophecy that Isaiah has given that we believe is fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. We believe this to be a messianic prophecy. What's the thing that he says right here the Messiah is going to do? He's going to bring God's people back to him. Okay? Verse 6, he says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. Now, see what comes next. I will make you as a light for the nations, and my, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It's not enough that I'm going to save Israel. I'm going to save them all. You're not just going to be my Messiah to the people of Israel. You're going to be the Messiah to the people of the world. Then we go down in verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Two things are going on here. One, when the Messiah comes, they're not going to like Him. But, two, God is going to exalt Him to the highest place. Again, we'll deal with this a little bit more next week as we see the actual fulfillment of this in uh, the New Testament. But one, when Jesus came, they didn't like him. Okay? And it wasn't just the Jews. Because uh, the, the Gentiles were mocking him too. All those that were gathered around the cross, they were mocking him. All right? But God lifted him up, and there will be a day where every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we go forward, it says, uh, verse 8, Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you, I will keep you, and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. So Jesus is actually going to be a new covenant. Okay? So all of these things are messianic implications for the day of atonement. Now quick... Uh, Flip over to Psalm 22. I'm just going to uh, hit a couple of verses out of this. Uh, some people believe that when Jesus was on the cross, he was actually quoting this, this psalm. Um, I think it is very likely because in some places it's word for word. Uh, verse 1, uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Does, does anybody catch that? Mm -hmm. See the similarity there? Mm -hmm. When Jesus is on the cross and, and he calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, so, so we see the affliction that is coming on him. He feels forsaken and abandoned of God. Um, jump down to verses 6 through 8. Uh, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me, all who see me, mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. So, one, the scorn of the people that we just talked about. Okay, remember it says that those that were gathered said, oh, he said he could tear down the temple and, and rebuild it in three Ds. Well, if you can do that, why don't you come down off the cross? And, and, and others, and the priests shook their heads and they said, well, you know, uh, he, he proclaims to save others. Let him save himself. Come on, let's see what you got. This is fulfilling this song. All right, let's, let's look down a couple more verses. Uh, verse 14 and 15. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Um, we know there were a number of things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. Does anybody remember what the shortest one was? I thirst. I thirst. I thirst. Now, as far as the bones being out of joint, um, there are actual medical doctors that believe by the way they put them on the cross, they would have most likely had to dislocate his shoulders, at least one of his shoulders, to get him on the cross. They actually did that for two purposes. One, because it made him suffer, and this was supposed to be all about suffering. And, and two, um, because the whole purpose of the cross is you could not sustain your weight in order, but the way you were hung on the cross the weight of your body would press down on your lungs and you couldn't get a deep breath. So you would have to push up on your feet to be able to draw a breath in. But then after a time, your body was so weakened that you would sag back down. The, the way you ultimately died on the cross was you suffocated. Okay? When they dislocated your shoulder, it made things progress a little bit further because you didn't have the strength of your arm to help support that weight. Okay? So all of my bones out of joint, it's very likely that his shoulder, at least one shoulder, possibly both, were dislocated. All right, so going down a little bit further, um, verse 16 says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Do I need to explain this one? <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is messianic, guys. Mm -hmm. This was literally fulfilled verse by verse at Calvary. Okay? One more passage of scripture, and then we're, we're going to uh, stop for today. Um, Psalm 110. I just want to read one verse out of there real quick. I'm going to give you a couple other verses for you to look at on your own. No, I'm not. I'm going to save it till next week, because next week we're going to get into the affliction part. Um, so Psalm 110. You ever feel like you turn page after page and all you see is Psalm 119? <laughs> okay, Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Now, homework for you this week. Okay. Jesus is called to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I want you to take a look at the story of Melchizedek. And I want you to try and understand, develop an understanding. If you want, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm giving away part of my message for next week. Get into Hebrews and see what the writer of Hebrews says, how Jesus is a priest, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Because God established in Israel, when he made them a nation, he chose the people of Levi, the men of Levi, to be his priests forever. Okay? And again, remember what forever means. 
okay, for a set time, not for eternity. Okay? And he says there is going to be one coming of the order of Melchizedek. So start digging in. Get yourselves into the Word. Take a look at Melchizedek in Genesis. Take a look at the order of Melchizedek, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek, and how Jesus fulfilled that in Hebrews. Amen? Okay, next week we're going to get into affliction and fulfillment. All right?